Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Ian Scott, and I'm the founder of Scott Legal. We are going to spend some time today uh, talking about the E-1 visa requirements. And the E-1 is a visa that really is what I call underutilized. So it will be interesting to spend some time going through these, these requirements. A few things before we get started. As some of you know that the firm was founded on an E-2 visa a few, a few years ago, eight years ago, and I'm personally in the United States on an E-2 visa. And the E-1 visa and E-2 visa are very, very related. Uh, we, we have renewed our E-2 visa once, and uh, to the extent that you want to share me to share my personal experience with respect to the renewal process with you, I'd be happy, happy to do that. We are a full-service immigration law firm, and we have processed hundreds of E-visas. And in particular, we focus on E-visas, both on the E-1 and E-2 visa side that are for smaller companies. So sometimes those are higher risk companies, but uh, higher risk applications, but for smaller companies. We have processed at consulates around the world, but our primary two consulates that we process E-visas at are Toronto and London. Uh, just in terms of a few other housekeeping items, we have a webinar series. This is one of a number of webinars that we do. We will do at least two webinars a month and often we will do more. And after we finish this particular webinar, we will send you some information. So first we will send you the PowerPoint presentation. We will send you a link to the uh, E to an E1 visa guide. So it's a comprehensive guide where you can, uh, which, which has a summary of all of the E1 visa requirements. And then we'll also send you a link where you can sign up for additional webinars. In terms of our panelists today, we're lucky to have Kelly Legrand Wiener, who is the managing attorney at the firm, and Michaela Vrazdova, who's an associate at the firm, and they both have vast experience in the e-visa area. And again, my name is Ian Scott. I'm the founder of the firm, and I will be the moderator. To the extent that you have any questions, please feel free to add them in the chat box. And if the final thing is this uh, video will be recorded and will be made available on demand. So without any further delay, we will turn it over to Kelly and Michaela. Hi everyone, um, good afternoon. Um, so I will start with a um, short introduction of what is E-1 visa, and I will explain the um, E-1 visa requirements. So the E-1 visa is a non-immigrant visa for either a person or a company who engages in substantial international trade between the, the US and uh, the home country. So in order to qualify for an E-1 visa, you need to meet um, the following requirements. So the, the first requirement is that you must be a national of an E-1 visa treaty country. So um, a lot of countries in, in Europe, um, Latin America, Africa, Asia are E-1 visa E-1 visa treaty countries. So, um, you know, just to just to provide a couple of examples, um, countries like UK, Canada, um, Japan, um, Thailand are all E-1 visa treaty countries. Then um, the second requirement you will need to meet um, in order to qualify for an E-1 visa is that you will need to demonstrate that there is an um, ongoing um, trade between the US and your, your home country. So um, this, this requirement has a um, has, has couple of sub requirements. So, so first you will need to demonstrate that there is an actual exchange of qualifying commodities between the US and your home country. So um, the qualifying commodities would be, could be either goods or um, it could also be a service. So um, just to illustrate um, you know, um, the trade of goods, so this could be, for example, a situation when you have um, a company in your home country. So let's say you have a company in the UK and you are selling certain you know, materials or fabrics to, to your clients in, in the US. And the, the provision of services would be, um, you know, for example, a situation um, when you have a, a company, let's say, in your home country, which you know, can be, for example, Canada, and you are providing, um, you know, for example, consulting services um, to your clients in the in the U.S. So the the provision of the consulting services um, could be could qualify um, as as an item of trade for the purposes of E1 visa. 
Um, the second sub requirement here is that the, the exchange or the trade between your home country and the US must be traceable and must be identifiable. So here, um, you know, we would we would need to submit certain documents to the consulate or to USCIS to to basically illustrate that the you know the trade is is ongoing. Um, so the documents we could submit are, for example, you know, invoices you are issuing to your clients. Um, you know, if you are if you are shipping goods from your home country to the US, we could submit um, bills of lading or or US customs documents. Um, we could submit your your tax returns to show that there is a trade. Um, and there are there are certain other types of documents that we could submit, and I will go over that in um, in a little bit more detail um, on, on on the next slide. And then um, the last sub requirement here is that um, the E1 trade must be already in existence at the time um, you are applying for an E1 visa. So, um, you know, usually when you are applying for an E1 visa, we would have to demonstrate to the consulate that, you know, the trade is already ongoing, um, has been ongoing for at least a couple of months. Um, as, a, as a rule of thumb, we usually recommend that the trade um, has been already kind of ongoing for at least six months. Uh, but the longer, um, you know, the trade has been already ongoing, um, usually the, the better it is for, for the application. Kayla, I have a, you know, there's a, one of the questions that was written in here. Um, you know, I know you mentioned that you're going to recommend that there be six months of trade ongoing. But so is, does that mean that the E1 is not possible for pure startup businesses? So there, there is actually one, one exception to this rule. And the exception is that, um, you know, the trade um, doesn't have to exist yet. Uh, but in, in that case, um, you would need to submit um, kind of, you know, contracts with your clients um, that are binding on both countries, uh, parties, and, and that would be kind of evidence um, that, the, you know, the, even though the trade is not yet, you know, kind of in existence, um, the trade will start, um, you know, kind of in a, in, a, in a short period of time. Now, um, I would say one thing to keep in mind here is, is that, um, you know, let's say you have, um, for example, 15 contracts with 15 different clients, and each um, contract is, for example, for um, you know two hundred um, two hundred thousand dollars. You know, I would say that is um, that is a strong application, and the consulate could you know grant you um, the E one visa, even though the the trade is not yet um, existing. Um, you know, on the on the other hand, um, if you have uh, you know two clients. Um, you have two contracts and each contract is, um, you know, for example, for $50,000, I, I think like that case would be um, kind of like definitely a riskier case and the consulate wouldn't have to have to grant you the visa because the, the trade is not yet existing and you only have two contracts um, for kind of like lower value. Um, so, so, so it will kind of depend on the, on, on, on the situation and on the, on the facts. Perfect, thank you. Um, so now the, the next requirement um, for the E-1 visa is that the trade between your home country and the U.S. must be substantial. And I will um, discuss this um, in, in more detail on um, later in the presentation. But basically, um, the immigration regulations, unfortunately, do not um, define what substantial means. Um, you know, the, the regulations kind of don't specify you know, for example, if you engage in trade, um, you know, of um, three hundred thousand dollars per year, like that is substantial trade, um, and and the, the immigration regulations um, only say that you know the trade must be substantial, and substantial trade means that there is a continuous flow of trade between your home country and the U.S. Um, and they basically look at the kind of like the number of clients you have, the number of transactions you have each year and kind of on the on the monetary value of the of the trade. But I will go over this um, in more detail um, later in the presentation. Um, the next requirement is that the E1 trade must be international. And this means that at least 50% of your international trade must be with the US, um, between the US and your home country. And um, I will discuss this um, in, in more detail in, in, in a little bit. Um, the, the next requirement for an E1 visa is that, um, you know, you as the E1 applicant, um, you must be coming to the US to engage 
in substantial trade. Um, and this basically means that you are coming to the US um, to kind of you know, manage, um, manage the, the E1 business. And the last requirement is that you must have intent um, to return to your home country once your E-1 visa expires. Um, so because the E-1 visa is a non-immigrant visa, um, you know, your, your intent um, cannot be to kind of permanently stay in the U.S. Um, however, um, you, will, you will not have to submit kind of evidence um, showing that you have extensive ties to your home country or anything like that. Um, what is usually sufficient for the E-1 application is that you submit um, a signed declaration in which you attest that, you know, once your E-1 visa expires, um, you will return to your home country. Perfect. And Michaela, there's a few, um, few questions people wrote in. Uh, so one, and we get this question a lot, is does the E-1 visa require any investment? No, so so this is a common um, misconception. So there is um, no investment required for the E-1 visa. Um, there is a, an investment required for the E-2 investor visa. Um, so I think that's why people often confuse it. But um, you don't have to invest any money um, in the U.S. to get to get the E-1 visa. Perfect. And just another. Um, so if you if you have a company abroad, you're already trading. Uh, but now you want to come to the U.S. on the E-1. Do you have to set up a new company in the United States? So not not necessarily. So um, you you do not have to set up a, a business entity um, in the U.S. Uh, but you know, in in some cases, for either tax or or liability purposes, um, you know, many people kind of prefer to set up LLC or or some form of of business entity. Um, you know, once once they come to the U.S., but it is it is not required. Perfect. And finally, um, are you allowed to bring your family with you? Um, you know, to, on the E-1 visa, and can you bring? Uh, who can you bring with you? Yeah. So um, you can bring your your spouse um, and your children um, that are um, under twenty one. So you can bring spouse and children, and then your your children can study in the U.S and your spouse can either study or, or work in the US. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so now let's move to the next slide. Um, so um, on this slide, we'll discuss um, a little bit, you know, um, what, is, what is trade and what can qualify as a trade for, for the purposes of E-1 visa. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, basically any item that is commonly traded in international um, commerce can be um, considered as an item of trade for the purposes of E-1 visa. So, um, as I mentioned, you can either be trading goods. Um, so, you know, for example, um, fabrics, you know, jewelry, furniture, or, or any kind of like tangible, anything tangible, or, um, you know, also services um, can be traded um, and can qualify, um, you know, for the purposes of E-1 visa. So, you know, you can, for example, be providing consulting services to your US client, uh, clients, tech services, you know, marketing services, or, or basically any service, and that, um, you know, that, that could qualify um, for, an, for an E-1 visa. So now, um, how, do we, how do we prove that there is an ongoing trade between the US and your, your home country? So um, usually we submit, you know, um, invoices you issue to your clients, um, you know, or bank statements kind of showing that you have been receiving money from clients or you have been paying clients. Um, we could submit, you know, the, the DHS customs documents showing that, you know, the goods you have been kind of like importing to the U.S. Um, have been kind of like entering the U.S. Uh, we could submit, um, you know, your if you have a company, um, we could submit, you know, your, your company's tax returns um, as evidence of, um, of trade. And um, usually um, all the consulates ask that, you know, when you are applying for an E-1 visa, that you submit um, like a detailed spreadsheet, um, kind of like, um, you know, that has every single transaction with each client for at least, you know, like um, the past year, some consulates want, some, some consulates want to see, um, you know, three, um, three most recent years. Um, so that's, um, that's what we um, almost always submit is kind of like an Excel spreadsheet um, that details like every single transaction with um, kind of like each client um, in the US you, you have. 
And, uh, one question, Michaela. So if, if someone is a consultant, for example, they're a consultant in Canada, um, you know, they provide consulting services to the U.S., to the U.S. clients, and now they physically move to the U.S., um, and they're still providing services to U.S. clients, is that trade still going to work? Is that going to be considered international for the E1? Yeah, so so in that case, um, what we usually recommend is that, you know, that, that person who, who moves to the U.S. Um, still keeps, um, you know, some employees in Canada or some workers in Canada that will still be performing, um, you know, the, the work for the U.S. clients. Um, in order for a trade to still be considered international, because if the the main trader moves to the U.S. and the main trader is kind of doing all the consulting work, you know, within from within the U.S., um, you know, the, then the the trade would not be uh, would no longer be international because the person is in the U.S. and is providing services to U.S. clients. So in cases like this, um, you know, we we recommend that there are still employees in Canada. Who will still be doing, um, you know, some or kind of like most of the work, and um, you know the 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 employees in Canada or the company, the entity in Canada, kind of like still invoices the the U.S. clients. Perfect. Thank you. So now um, let's move on to the on to the next slide. So. Um, now we'll discuss the kind of like the the question we almost always get um and that is you know how much trade is enough for the e1 visa and what is um what is substantial trade so um as i mentioned you know unfortunately the the e1 immigration regulations kind of don't exactly specify you know what amount of trade is substantial but the regulations do say that you know the the e1 business or the e1 um, trader must engage in a continuous flow of trade between the us and the, the treaty country so what the consulate will basically look at is um, the consulate will look at you know so let's take the situation that you are um, you know you are canadian um, and you are providing consulting services to U.S. clients. So the consulate will uh, basically look at um, how many clients you have in the U.S. And then they will look at how many kind of like invoices you issued to each client um, in, you know, the most recent year. And what was the monetary value of, of each invoice or each transaction? So... Um, and, you know, when they kind of like look at all these three um, things together, they will conclude, you know, whether the trade is substantial or, or no. So um, what we usually recommend is that the trade is at least um, $250,000 per year. Um, and, you know, um, it, it is possible to apply if the trade is a little bit lower, but, um, you know, those cases uh, would definitely be, be, be riskier. So um, it's kind of like a general rule of thumb we, we recommend that the trade um, is at least $250,000 um, per year. And um, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if, if, if you are kind of like trading with the U.S. and you only have one client in the U.S. or let's say, you know, in 2020, you sold, um, you know, there was like one big transaction and you sold um, goods worth of, you know, let's say $5 million to, to one U.S. client. Um, you know, that um, kind of like that single transaction um, would kind of like never be sufficient for an E-1 visa, because really for the E-1 visa, you have to um, you have to show that there is the continuous flow of trade and you have to show that you have, you know, multiple clients in the U.S., um, you know, there are kind of like multiple transactions um, with each client every year. And then, um, you know, the consulate will also consider the monetary value of the transaction. But, um, but, but yeah, in the situation that there was like a huge one transaction, but only with one client, one transaction, that would never be um, sufficient for um, the E-1 visa. And now um, a question we, we, get, we get often from our you know, uh, potential clients is um, can a small business qualify um, for an E1? So um, the, the regulations actually kind of like specifically state that even small business owners um, can qualify for an E1 visa. But again, um, you know, you would have to demonstrate that um, even though your business is small, you have, um, you know, multiple clients, um, you know, there are multiple transactions each year with each client. 
Um, and in this case, you know, the kind of like the, the monetary value of each transaction could be, um, you know, kind of a little bit lower, but you would still have to demonstrate that you have a lot of clients, a lot of transactions. And again, um, you know, we wouldn't recommend that the trade is lower than um, $250,000 per year um, because those, ca those cases are just um, much riskier. And um, one thing to keep in mind also is that the E1 trade must remain substantial even after you get the E1 and, and come to the US. So, um, you know, many, many people kind of think that, you know, the trade must be kind of high and substantial at the time you apply for the E1 visa. But once you, once you have the E1 visa, you know, it doesn't really matter um, you know, um, what's the value of the trade. Um, but that is, you know, in order, you know, when at some point in the future, when you'll be renewing your E-1 visa, um, you know, you, you will be submitting your, your tax returns and kind of financial documents um, and the consulate will, will, will take a look at those. Um, so, you know, the, the trade must remain substantial even after you, you kind of like come to the U.S., and, and you get the E-1 visa, um, you know, just so your E-1 visa renewal goes, goes smoothly. Perfect. And, and Michaela, for these small companies that have these lower trade amounts, is there anything else that they can do to strengthen their cases, you know, knowing that they're going to go in with, you know, a, a lower amount? Yeah, I would say in those cases, um, you know, even let's say the, you know, the trade um, is, you know, lower than $250,000. I think, you know, um, in that case, um, if you have U.S. employees, um, let's say you employ, um, you know, five U.S. employees, but your trade is, you know, not, not that high, you know, that would be kind of like definitely um, beneficial to mention in the, in the E-1 application. Um, so, so um, or, you know, if you, for example, have a, have a lot of clients, um, and if you also have, um, you know, kind of like binding negotiated contracts with new clients, but the contracts will kind of start in a couple of months, you know, you could definitely submit those and basically argue, um, you know, look, the, the trade is, you know, um, the trade is, let's say, $200,000, but I have all these additional contracts. Um, so that I think, um, you know, for example, those two things, um, you as employees and um, some additional contracts, with um, you know new potential clients could could help in in that case. So now uh, let's uh, let's discuss some other E1 trade um, considerations. So as 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 we already um, discussed um, a little bit, um, you know the the the, the question we, um, we 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 often get is. Uh, whether you know the trade has to exist at the time you are applying for an E-1 visa. So um, as we as we as we discussed, you know the the answer is generally yes. But there is the one exception if you have you know binding um, contracts with clients for kind of like high monetary value. In that case, the trade wouldn't have to exist yet at the time you are applying for an E-1 visa. But you would have to submit those um, those contracts um, to the consulate as, as evidence that. You know the, the trade will kind of start um you know in a couple couple days or or a couple couple weeks and um now we'll discuss uh briefly the the requirement you know that the trade must be between the the us and your your home country so um the requirement here is that um at least 50 percent of the international trade must be between the the us and your your home country so let's look at this um, example. So um, let's say you have a company in Spain that manufactures glass and exports um, the glass to other countries and also kind of like trades within the within Spain. So um, if the I think there is um, a typo in this um, in this example, I think the sales with uh, with Spain, let's say the, sa the sales with Spain are, you know, one million one million dollars. Um, you know, the sales with the US are half a million dollars and the sales with China are half a million dollars. So for um, the purposes of E-1 visa, we, we disregard the domestic trade with, the, with Spain. So that doesn't matter um, for the purposes of E-1 visa. And now we look just at the international trade. So there is a trade of half a million dollar um, with the US and half a million dollar with China. So the, requir the, e the requirement um, you know, for, for the E1 is that at least 
50% of the international trade is with the US. Um, you know, here 50% of the trade is with the US. So um, in this scenario, you would you you would you 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 would qualify for the E1 visa, and you would meet um, the requirement that you know the the trade must be must be international. And this um you know this comes up a lot, uh, Michaela. And so just to kind of reiterate. So if you have a company that primarily, like let's say is doing millions of dollars, you know, like Spain within their own, their own country, um, they're just primarily, that's where they have most of their business, but they also have some small amount of trade, um, you know, with the United States, like let's say they have, you know, $50 million in revenue each year, but they have maybe $300,000 of trade that they're doing with the US. In that type of scenario, um, is an E1 possible? Yeah, so it's definitely possible, and we we have had um, we have we have processed E one visa for for that kind of scenario. Um, so yeah, if you know um, a company is kind of like selling you know products to U.S. clients and imports you know certain materials, um, and yeah, the, the revenues are millions and millions of dollars, and imports you know um, you know three materials worth of um, as you mentioned, Kelly, three hundred thousand dollars per year um, from some from some E one treaty country. In that case, um, yeah, it's it's definitely possible to um, still apply for um, for E one visa, and we have had um, we have had that um, kind of like situation and, and processed E one visa for for that type of situation. Perfect. Um, and we have a, another question that came in: um, Is it more important to show a continuous flow of trade? or value of transactions. Uh, for example, we have more than three years of transactions monthly, but value is less than 160K in revenue yearly. Yeah, so I would, I would say like the consulate look at, um, you know, like those things together. Um, so they look, um, you know, at the, you know, number, number of clients, number of transactions, and then the, the monetary value of the trade. So, you know, let's say you have, um, you know, 40 clients, um, you know, like 500 transactions per year, but the trade um, is only $160,000. I think, you know, in, in this case, like the number of clients, the number of transactions would definitely be helpful. Um, but, you know, I would, um, the, the, the revenue, um, in our experience, it may be a little bit too low, um, you know, for, for E1. Um, so, you know, it, it may be good to maybe wait a little bit longer or, um, you know, get some additional contracts with, um, you know, other clients or, um, you know, in, in case you want to go ahead and submit the E1 application, um, it may be good to kind of emphasize if you have you as employees and things like that. But, um, yeah, I would say the concept kind of like looks at the, you know, the, the whole situation um, together, you know, the clients, transactions, the monetary value. And um, you know, then makes the the assessment of whether or not the the trade is um, substantial. Okay, so now um, let's discuss uh, briefly, um, you know, how you can apply for an E one visa. So the first option is um, to apply to apply um, at a consulate. And if you are applying at a U.S. consulate abroad, um, you would be applying for an E-1 visa. So um, what an e E-1 visa allows you, um, you know, you can kind of like travel in and out of the U.S. on a, on an, on a, on a visa. Um, now you can you can also apply for, you know, an E-1 E-1 status um, with with the USCIS. But USCIS only grants you an E1 status within the US. Um, so in, in case you want to leave at some point, you want to travel you know, to, to, to your home country, you would need um, to apply for an E1 visa at a, at a consulate abroad anyway. So um, for, for this reason, um, before COVID, I would say um, almost all the, the E1 applications we processed, uh, we, we were submitting them at a, at a US consulate abroad. And that was um, just because um, most people at some point want to, want to leave the US and want to come back. And um, for, for that reason, they, they want to get the, the E1 visa. Um, now, during COVID, this changed um, a little bit because many people, um, are currently in the U.S. on some other status. They want to now change the status to the to E1 to E1 status. Um, 
so they kind of um, so we have had more cases when we were when we started kind of filing um, E1 change of status applications with with the USCIS. Um, and also another reason why now E1 change of status applications with USCIS became kind of like um, more uh, more frequent is that many consulates abroad are either closed or they are not processing routine visas um, or the the kind of like the wait time for an E1 visa appointment may be several months. Um, so, so many people, um, I would say COVID kind of like changed this and we have been, uh, we have been processing, um, a lot more E1 change of status petitions with, um, with the USCIS. And, and Michaela, just, um, you know, putting aside COVID for a minute, you know, when, you know, if we can kind of look forward perhaps into the next, uh, you know, year or so, you know, hopefully as things start to get better, what was consular processing wait times? What were those like for E1s prior to uh, the pandemic? Yeah, uh, I would say usually um, around like four to to ten weeks. Um, some yes, something like that. So um, so so before COVID, it was kind of really um, you know a person submitted the petition. Some consulates it was even like two or three weeks, but I would say generally around like two, three, four months. Um, so it was, it was, it was generally, generally pretty, pretty fast. Perfect. And, um, and how long can E1 visas be granted for? Yeah. So, um, so this, this, this will depend on a, on a country where the E1 national is from, because each E1, um, visa, um, country has kind of like different, um, period of time for which the E1 visa can be granted. Um, but some countries um, grant, um, you know, some nationals of some countries can get the E1 visa for up to five years. Um, so that was another reason why people kind of preferred to, to submit the petition at a consulate. They would get the E1 visa for five years. Um, um, and on the other hand, when you are kind of applying for a change of status with, with USCIS, um, you are only granted the, the, the E1 status for, for two years. Um, and again, when you when you leave, you would you would need the E1 visa anyway. So um, so so I would say generally the applying for an E1 visa to consulate has um, many more benefits. But because of COVID, because the long wait times, um, I would say now um, if you are in the US, it may be um, it may be definitely better to file um, a change of status petition with uh, with USCIS. And for, for people that are kind of looking at, you know, maybe they're already in the U.S. right now, but they're still not interested in filing with USCIS, do they have to go back to their home country's consulate to apply or are there other places they could apply? Yeah, so in the past, uh, many people who, you know, let's, who were kind of like living in the U.S. on some other um, immigration status and they were kind of thinking about E1, their home country is far, far away, for example, Australia. Uh, before COVID, we had kind of like many people, um, you know, um, submitting their E1 petitions to, um, you know, for example, the, the consulate in Toronto, um, or, you know, some people were applying at um, other consulates like in, in, in Central or, or South America. Um, I would say again, like COVID kind of changed this. Um, most consulates now kind of like limit who can apply um, for a visa at, at, at the consulate. So many consulates now only allow their own nationals or you know permanent residents to apply for a visa at that consulate. And you know even though Canada now still allows people to submit E1 petitions um, at the US consulate in Toronto, um, Canada doesn't um, currently allow foreign nationals to enter um, the country unless they fall under like very narrow um, exceptions. So in, in Toronto, the problem is even though people are able to submit the petitions, they are even able to schedule an interview, they are not able to, to physically enter um, the country. So that has been kind of like um, an issue, um, you know, we have been seeing for now a couple of months, we thought maybe, you know, Canada will kind of like lift um, the, the travel ban they have, but they, um, they, they haven't done so yet. And now with the COVID cases rising and the, the whole situation, I'm, I'm not sure when, when they will be able to do that. Um, so I would say um, at this point, it, it just may be 
the best to apply um, in your home country because you are, you know, you, you, you are always allowed to come back to your home country. Um, so, um, so you don't, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't have these, um, these issues of entering like country you are not national of and, um, you know, waiting and waiting for an interview and like, kind of like not being able to, to enter the country. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So now, um, let's move on the, on the next slide. So um, here we'll discuss briefly some, some recent um, E1 visa developments and um, adjudication trends. So um, we were getting this, um, these two questions you know, a lot um, when, the, when the COVID started and we will still get them uh, from, our, from our clients or um, potential clients. So the first question is, um, you know, if, you know, let's say you, you, you have an E1 visa, but because of COVID, um, you know, you you kind of like left the U.S. a couple months ago. You are living in your home country, and you kind of like haven't been in the in the U.S. since like uh, March 2020. So, um, will this be an issue? Um, you know, when you will be renewing your your E1 visa? So the short answer is no. Um, it is not required that you know once you get the E1 visa that you live in the U.S. full time. Um, many people think that once they have the, the, the E1 visa, they kind of like have to stay here um, at least for, you know, majority of the, of the, of the time of the year. But that is, that is, not, that is not correct. Um, you know, we have clients who just, even before COVID, they would just kind of like come um, to the U.S. for, for a couple and spend here a couple months a year, kind of like, you know, manage the E1 business, but they would still um, spend kind of like majority of their time in their home country. We also have clients who would only spend a couple of weeks or just a couple of days in the U.S. and on the E1 visa. Um, so, so, this will, um, so this will not be an issue because um, it is not required that you kind of like live um, full time in the, in the U.S. Um, when, you, when you have an E1 visa. And um, the other kind of like question um, we, we have been getting a lot is whether, um, you know, it will be an issue if the, if the trade between your home country and the US um, has declined, you know, in, in 2020 or, or 2021 um, because of COVID. So um, here I would say that you definitely, um, when you will be renewing your E1 visa, you want to kind of briefly explain in the in the cover letter, you know why the why the trade um, declined. Um, briefly expa explain um, what um, what impact has COVID had on your business, um, and 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 briefly address that. But I think if the the trade will kind of increase at some point um, after COVID, um, I wouldn't um, necessarily think that this will be um, a big issue just because. Um, COVID has been has had um, a huge effect on economy globally, and you know, I think the, the the consular officers will definitely have um, understanding that you know most businesses have um, lost some money um, during COVID. So I would say if the trade has been you know really high, then dropped um, during COVID, but then increased again, um, I think um, I think that should be fine um, when when you will be renewing your your E1 visa. Okay, so now um, let's uh, briefly discuss um, three three issues here. Um, the, so the first thing um, we and 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 clients and potential clients of, often ask this question is whether they need a business plan um, if they want to apply for an E one visa. So um, I would say not necessarily. Um, you definitely need a business plan if you are applying for an E2 investor visa. For the E1 visa, um, business plan is not required, but I would say in some cases it may be it may be helpful. So um, let's say you um, you you know the, the trade is kind of not not ongoing, not existing yet. Um, you know, you, you have um, 15 contracts with potential clients in the US, you have plans to hire employees, um, you know, in, in case like that, I think a business plan would definitely uh, be helpful for the E1 petition. And, um, you know, in the, in the business plan, you could, you could um, explain 
who are your clients, you know, how much revenue you are planning to get from, from each client in the, in the next couple of years. You could explain your kind of like marketing efforts, how you are planning to gain, um, you know, additional clients. You could explain how many employees you are planning to hire in the US. So um, I would say it kind of depends on, um, on, the, on the situation. So if you have a, you know, if you have, a, if, you, if you already have an existing business, the trade with the US is every year, you know, above $1 million, like in, in that case, I don't think a, a business plan is necessary. But in those um, kind of more like borderline um, cases, um, you know, business plan uh, may definitely be helpful um, for, for an E1 application. Um, then, um, then the, another, another thing, um, which, which also may be, um, clients are, are all, all often, um, confused about is whether, um, they need to hire, um, us employees for, for an E1 visa. So, um, the answer is, um, not necessarily, um, again, um, employees would definitely be required, um, you know, if you, if you are applying for E2 investor visa, but for an E1 visa, uh, you, do, you do not have to hire, um, you as employees. Um, it is definitely, um, you know, helpful for the application. If you do already have you as employees, or if you are planning to hire you as employees in the future, and I would definitely mention it in your, in your E1 application, but it is, it is not required, um, to employ, um, you as employees, um, on, if you, if you get, um, E1 visa. And, um, I just want to quickly mention that, you know, some, uh, some of our clients or some people qualify for both E1 visa and E2 visa. And, um, you know, when we kind of advise um, clients, you know, what, what visa is better and we kind of um, explain what they need to do for an E1 visa and E2 visa, uh, many, many people, or I would say most uh, people um, decide to go ahead and apply for an E1 visa. And that is um, just because as we mentioned in the beginning, there is no investment needed um, for an E-1 visa. So you don't have to invest any money in the US. Um, there is no requirement that you employ US employees on an E-1 visa. Uh, so I would say um, these two things are kind of like um, when, when client kind of like hear that they don't need to invest money. Um, and, you know, I, I would say while many people at some point will have you as employees anyway, uh, but they don't have to have employees immediately, you know, um, many, most people, um, definitely if they have the option that they qualify for both E1 and E2 visa, um, most people decide to go ahead with the, with the E1 visa. Michaela, on the, on the question of employees, what if the, the trader has some, you know, key employees in, uh, you know, in their home country uh, or are elsewhere working for them that they want to bring to the U.S.? Is that possible with the E-1? Yeah, so there is um, an, uh, what is called E-1 employee visa. And basically the, um, the E-1 trader can bring um, either a managerial or executive employee from the home country to the U.S., or the second category of employee um, they, um, the trader can bring is um, what's called specialized employee. So um, that would be someone who has some, um, you know, specialized skills or specialized knowledge about the, you know, the, the E1 trade, the, 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 the E1 business. So, um, so yeah, those two categories of employees um, can apply for an E1 employee visa and, and come to the US. And is there any nationality requirement? Yes. Yeah, so the so the E one employees have to have the same nationality as the as the E one trader. Perfect. Thank you. And um, I think we discussed this um, in a little bit, but um, so there is there is no business entity um, required. Um, so it is it is not required that you have you set up a business entity in the U S. And it is also not required that you have um, a business entity in your home country. So many, um, many clients we have are just um, individuals who don't have any company in the in their foreign country. And they have just been kind of like individually, you know, selling products or services to US clients. And that is that is completely fine. So, um, so you don't have to, you don't have to have entity um, in the US, you don't have to have entity in your home country. 
um, but many um, many people prefer that, um, as I mentioned, for either tax or or liability purposes to eventually set up set up um, set up the entities. So now um, let's move um, on the next slide. Um, so some common reasons for um, E1 denial. So I would say the the most common reason for the E1 denial is that the um, the trade amount is just um, too low. So um, you know, let's say you you have a trade um, in the most recent year. You had a trade with um, the U.S. of um, fifty thousand um, dollars. So as as I mentioned, you know that that number. Uh, maybe just just a little bit too low. Um, as I mentioned, we we generally um, recommend that the trade is at least two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. If it's lower than that, um, you know um, you could submit the contracts for a future for a future trade. Um, you know you could submit evidence of employees. But um, I would say those applications when the trade amount is lower. Um, then two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. They would just be um, a little bit riskier, um, as the as the consulate um, like to see the, the the trade amount is a little bit um, a little bit higher. Um, a second um, common reason for denial is that um, you just have um, you know you have a very few clients in the U.S. So um, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you have only one US clients that will kind of like never be sufficient for for an E1. Um, if you have you know two, three, four clients, that that number can is is still a little bit too low. Um, you know, I would say if you have you know at least 10, um, 15 clients, like that would be um, you know that would be great for for an E1 visa. Um, then um, a third common reason for the denial is that you do not have enough transactions um, with the U.S. clients. So let's say you have, um, you know, five clients in the U.S. and to each of the each of the client you issued, you know, like one invoice um, in the, you know, in, in 2020. So there will only be five transactions. Um, so that's um, that's definitely low, um, you know, for the E1 visa. Um, so again. Um, it's, it's very hard to kind of like give uh, exact numbers, but I would say um, with, with each client, you know, if you have, for example, 50 clients um, and with each of those clients, you, you issue them like two or three invoices, like that may be sufficient. But I would say generally um, kind of like the, the more transactions there are, um, the, the better it is for, for the E1 application. Um, then the, the next uh, common reason for the denial is that um, less than 50% of the international trade is with the is between the, the US and the home country. And you know, sometimes this is when um, clients kind of don't um, don't realize that you know more than 50% of the of the international trade has to be with the US. Um, so, um, so so that can be a common reason for the denial. Um, and the you know the, the last kind of like common reason for denial is that um, you know you the trade is not existing at the time you are applying for the E1 visa and you do not have any um, kind of like binding contracts um, with the U.S. clients. So, um, so 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 the consulate would basically conclude that you don't meet the you know the the the, the E1 visa requirement. I would say in, in this case when um, you know the, there is no trade yet and you are still kind of like looking for clients in the US, um, you may want to come to the US on a B1 uh, business visitor visa and kind of um, you know explore the market, um, you know meet with potential clients, kind of negotiate the contracts, um, and you know B1 visa would be kind of like perfect visa for that. Um, but, 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 but yeah, if the trade is not existing and you don't have any contracts, um, E1 visa is, um, is, is not a, is not a good visa at, um, kind of like that stage, um, you know, of the, of the business. And, and Michaela, if you do actually get a denial, uh, is there anything you can do? Can you reapply? Are you prevented? Um, what's the process? Yeah. So, um, you can definitely reapply, um, at the, you know, the, at the same consulate, um, you would just, um, I would say, um, at the E1 interview, um, if the consular officer kind of tells you that your E1 visa is being denied, 
um, you want to ask, um, you know, what's the what's the reason for the denial? So it's kind of clear, and you know what you need to do, what you need to address um, in the reapplication. So that's. Um, really important um, to always ask uh, because the, the consular officers often just give you a piece of paper that says, you know, we are denying the visa, but don't, you know, they don't kind of like tell you the reasons, but if you ask, um, they, they, they generally do tell you. So um, at the interview, you know, if it, if it doesn't go well, um, I would recommend that you ask, um, you know, what is that they are kind of like unhappy about and in the reapplication, um, you know, you, you, you should kind of address, um, you know, if the, if the trade amount is too low, you know, you can wait a couple of months, um, get new clients, and then just, just reapply a couple of months later. Perfect. So now um, let's discuss briefly, uh, you know, the, the process of um, renewing your, your E-1 visa. So in the, in the renewal E1 application, um, you will have to um, demonstrate that you still meet all the, all the E1 visa requirements. So you, so you will need to, um, as I mentioned, submit um, kind of like spreadsheets. Um, so let's say you know, your E1 visa was um, originally granted for, for five years. Um, so in the reapplication, um, you, know, you, would, you would generally be submitting two or three um, kind of like um, spreadsheets, kind of like analyzing the, the, the trade for um, the two or three most recent years. Um, so the trade, um, you know, you should still be able to demonstrate that the, that the trade is substantial. Um, you will, you will um, need to show that the trade is still um, at least 50% with the US. Um, so in the, in the renewal E1 application, um, you will you will have to demonstrate that you still qualify for E1 visa by meeting all the all the E1 visa requirements. Um, so one 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 advice here is to always check the the website of the of the consulate where um, you know you will be kind of applying um, to renew your your E1 visa because um, each consulate has kind of very specific requirements on what evidence they want. Uh, what documents they want. Um, some consulates have kind of like page limit on how many documents you can, how many pages you can submit. So you definitely want to um, want to want to check the consulate of the website um, to kind of see what what documents you will need to submit for for the renewal. Perfect. And um, I know that I think we went over this a little bit earlier, perhaps, but. Um, if somebody has to be kind of a 50% owner from a treaty country national, and now they want to take on a business partner or they want to have, you know, other people buy shares of their company, is this allowed? Yeah, so it's, um, it's allowed to take, um, you know, a business partner or to kind of, um, you know, sell some of the shares. Um, but one important thing to keep in mind is that you always have to own at least 50%. Um, if you have a business entity, you always have to own at least 50% um, in the business. So you can take, you can definitely take a business partner if the ownership will be, you know, 50, 50, uh, but you always, you, you have to keep the, the majority um, in the, in the, in the company. So if you, if you get an E1 visa um, and then your majority or your ownership falls below 50%, is that a problem? Yeah, that would definitely be a problem. Um, and, you know, basically, um, you know, you, um, you wouldn't be, be qualified for the, the, the visa anymore. Um, so I would generally advise if there is any ownership change is going to happen that you um, contact an immigration attorney before any change of ownership happens, just to make sure that, you know, you will, you'll be able to kind of maintain and, and keep your, your E1 status. Great, thank you. Perfect. So now let's move um, on to the next slide. Okay, so are there any um, questions? So I think we answered all the questions that um, were sent in earlier and that we had on the uh, on, on the Q and A. So I think we are we are all set. Perfect. Great. 
Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, both Michaela and Kelly. It was an excellent uh, presentation, a lot of great information there. And in terms of, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we are going to send you a number of different things. We will send you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. We will send you a link to where you can sign up for future webinars. We have a number of webinars coming up. We have one on February 4th at 2 p.m., which is on the brother or sister of the E1 visa, which is the E2 visa, and in particular, it's going to focus on risky cases. Uh, the next few webinars that we have coming up, we have one on H1Bs on February 10th. We have another one on E2s and then another few after that on extraordinary ability, green cards, and uh, also national interest waiver. So a number of different webinars coming up and we'll send you a link to those. And then we'll also send you a link to where you can access a free E1 visa guide. So this visa guide has a lot of the information that we went over today. So again, thank you very much for joining us. And we also, this session has been recorded and we that will also be included in the email where you can access that recording. Thank you.